So during what's probably the busiest time of my entire life so far, I for whatever reason decided to undertake making a video about every single Senate and gubernatorial election this year. Gubernatorial is a funny word, but it means election for governor, and there's 37 of them this year. So let's do the first 18 today in order of when the primary was. We begin with my home state of Texas. They held their primary way before everybody else on Tuesday, March 1st. Incumbent Republican Governor Greg Abbott is running for a third term. He's the only governor running for a third term right now after Charlie Baker of Massachusetts declined to do so. Unlike 2018, Abbott faced some primary challengers, all of whom were more conservative. They included former U.S. Representative from Florida Alan West, comedian and talk show host Chad Prather, and former state Senator Don Huffines. But Abbott still easily won with 66.5% of the vote and carried every county. The Democratic primary was pretty uneventful because the Democrats got probably the best candidate they could, and that was former U.S. Representative Beto O'Rourke, who almost beat Ted Cruz in 2018 and then launched a suicide campaign for president in 2020. He won the nomination with 91 0.4% of the vote, but interestingly didn't win every county, which makes him the highest share of the vote in any election I've covered to not win every county. He placed second in two counties with very small populations and lost King County by default because no Democrats voted there. There were also rumors of actor Matthew McConaughey running as an independent, but he ended up not doing it, which would have made this race really interesting because he would have actually had a chance at winning. But hey, there's always 2026 or 2030, right? So the election is Greg Abbott versus Beto O'Rourke. Politico rates this race likely Republican. This election is being very over -polled in my opinion. There's like four polls that come out every week and all of them show Abbott winning by like 7%. They had their first debate the other day. I didn't watch it. I assume Beto said some variation of the F word like 20 times. And I assumed Abbott talked about the border at least every 30 seconds. And Beto probably talked a lot about the Uvalde shooting. He actually confronted Greg Abbott uh, at a press conference right after, which is interesting because usually, you know, the two nominees for any given statewide election, they don't often meet in person outside of debating. The next primary was Ohio which was on May 3rd. Incumbent Republican Governor Mike DeWine is running for a second term. He faced a lot of backlash for implementing too many COVID restrictions, and so he had some primary challengers. Most notably, farmer Joe Blystone, former U.S. Representative Jim Renassi, and former State Representative Ron Hood. Early polling showed Renassi winning, but DeWine ended up winning with just a plurality, making him the only Republican governor to do so. He finished with just 48.1% of the vote. Renassi won two counties, and despite coming in third, Blystone won 22. In the Democratic primary, former Cincinnati Mayor John John Cranley faced off against former Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley. Whaley won 65% of the vote and carried 80 of the state's 88 counties, which is mostly credited to her endorsement from Ohio's Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown. Interestingly, Cranley won four counties near Cincinnati, but lost his home county of Hamilton. Once I finished editing, I realized I left out a few things, so I'm going to periodically interject. So the race is Mike DeWine versus Nan Whaley. Politico rates this race likely Republican, and all the polls right now show DeWine winning by a huge margin. The following week, May 10th, was the Nebraska primary. Incumbent Republican Governor Governor Pete Ricketts is term limited this year. The Democratic primary was pretty boring. It only had two people, and it was obvious that State Senator Carol Blood would win. She got 88.7% of the vote and carried all but one county. The Republican primary was a lot more interesting. Nine people ran, but there were three frontrunners. They included businessman Charles Herbster, businessman Jim Pillen, and State Senator Brett Lindstrom. Now, Herbster was endorsed by Trump, but by the end, Pillen came out of nowhere and won a close victory. He got 33.9% of the vote. And counting up all of the counties he won, um, I don't really feel like doing that right now, but he won a lot of them. <laughs> so the race is Jim Pillen versus Carol Blood. And big shocker here, Politico rates this race solid Republican. Tuesday, May 17th had a few different primaries, so let's start with Idaho. Yeah, this is this election was a complete mess. Incumbent Republican Governor Brad Little is running for a second term. Three people ran for the Democratic nomination, all of whom were former Republicans. You see, Shelby Rogenstad and David Riley were both disqualified from the primary because they were still registered Republicans at the time of filing. So college instructor Stephen Height won the nomination by default, and even he didn't expect it. The Republican primary had a lot of contenders, but the main two were obviously incumbent Governor Brad Little and his own Lieutenant Governor Janice Magachin. The two had hella beef over some stuff that went down last year. Basically, every time Little left the state, Magachin would claim to be acting governor and pass a bunch of crazy executive orders, and then Little would come back and rescind them immediately because they were ridiculous. There was also alt-right activist Amon Bundy, but he dropped out to run as an independent. He's literally an anti-government activist, and I don't know if he'll get 5% of the vote, but he's worth mentioning. And he's not related to Tedward Bundy. 
Bundy. <laughs> anyway, Little won with 52.8% of the vote and carried 40 of Idaho's 44 counties. And of course, the four counties that McGachin won were in northern Idaho, which is apparently like the most far right area of the country. I visited there this summer. I didn't see it. But yeah, anyway, the race is Brad Little versus Stephen Height and Politico rates this race solid Republican. Now let's talk about Pennsylvania. Incumbent Democratic Governor Tom Wolf is term limited this year. Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro ran unopposed for the Democratic nomination. The Republican primary had nine candidates, but it looked like the real race would be between former U.S. Representative Lou Barletta and State Senator Doug Mastriano. Mastriano was controversial for a host of reasons, most notably being involved with January 6th and being far right, basically. This led to Trump endorsing him just three days before the primary. He had already started gaining momentum before that, and it's important to note that there were originally more than nine candidates, but a lot of them dropped out during the, like, ten days before the primary and endorsed Barletta, so that they could hopefully unite against Mastriano, but it wasn't even close. Mastriano won with 43.8% of the vote and carried 55 of the state's 67 counties. So the race is Doug Mastriano versus Josh Shapiro. After Mastriano won the primary, Politico changed this race from toss-up to lean Democratic, and honestly, I would not be surprised if they changed it to likely Democratic. Mastriano's campaign is imploding on itself. They have no money. He tweeted an ad from Michigan yesterday because he doesn't really have any ads of his own. I'm not going to say Shapiro will win by like 20% or something, but the, the Republicans really blew this one, which is going to become a common theme. You know, the instance of Nebraska where the Trump endorsed candidate lost the primary, uh, that was more of an outlier. But anyway, let's drop that for a second and talk about Oregon, which is a primary Trump did not intervene in. This is my favorite election to watch this year. Incumbent Democratic Governor Kate Brown is term limited this year. Both primaries were very crowded. The Democrats had 15 contenders, but the main two were former state House Speaker Tina Kotek and state treasurer Tobias Reed. Kotek won with 57.9% of the vote and carried 25 of the state's 36 counties. The Republican primary was even more crowded, having 25 candidates at one point. The major candidates included a bunch of different people, including the nominee from 1998 and the nominee from 2016. Honestly, there's eight different candidates I could mention, but downloading all their photos and making graphics for all of them is going to be hard, so we'll just talk about the main two. They were former state House Minority Leader Christine Drazen and former state representative Bob Tiernan. Drazen won with just 23% of the vote. She won 21 counties while Tiernan won six. Bud Pierce won two, and for whatever reason, seventh place finisher Carrie McQuiston won seven counties. But it doesn't end there because there's also a notable independent candidate. Former Democratic state senator Betsy Johnson decided to run as an independent, which is rumored to be because Tina Kotek drew her district into a more Trump area where she probably would not have won re-election. So she was basically like, screw you, I'm running for governor instead. So the election is Tina Kotek versus Christine Drazen versus Betsy Johnson. Oregon hasn't elected a Republican governor in over 40 years, but the dynamics of this race make it possible. Politico changed this race from likely Democratic to lean Democratic and uh, probably should follow suit with all the other news organizations that have changed it to toss up. Drazen's been leading in polls recently, mostly because Kotek and Johnson are splitting a lot of the vote. So basically, I think I'm clairvoyant because they did change it to toss up. Actually, the day after I filmed this, so today's October 4th, I filmed this on the 2nd. Yesterday, they changed it to toss up. It's also the first statewide election in America in history to feature a three-way race between all women. There were two primaries on May 24th, so let's start with Arkansas. Incumbent Republican Governor Asa Hutchinson is term limited this year, but before he left office, I got to go see the state capitol and his parking spot and his office and the governor's reception room and everything like that. The Republican primary originally had four candidates. They included Attorney General Leslie Rutledge and Lieutenant Governor Tim Griffin, but they both dropped out and decided to run for each other's positions instead, which cleared the path for former White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders to win the nomination with 83.1% of the vote. The Democratic primary had five candidates, but the front runner was businessman Chris Jones, who won with 70.5% of the vote. So the election is Sarah Huckabee Sanders versus Chris Jones. This election is that it's a formality. Sarah Huckabee Sanders not only has very high name recognition from being the face of the Trump administration for like a year, but she's also the daughter of former Governor Mike Huckabee. So if I return to Arkansas in 2023, I'll be visiting her office instead. So obviously Politico rates this race solid Republican, and if slash when Huckabee wins, she'll be the first millennial governor ever. Isn't that crazy? Now let's talk about Georgia. Ah, oh, good memories from Georgia. Incumbent Republican Governor Brian Kemp is running for a second term. Any Democrat who wanted to run against him had to wait on an announcement from one person, and that was former State House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams, who was the nominee in 2018 and still refuses to concede that she lost that race. Once she announced her campaign on December 1st of last year, it was a done deal and she won the nomination unopposed. The Republican primary got interesting with Kemp being challenged by former U.S. Senator David Perdue, who lost his seat to John Ossoff last year 
year. This election was the epicenter of the phenomenon where Trump would find a different candidate to try and primary an incumbent because the incumbent didn't do what he wanted after the 2020 election. So he endorsed Purdue because Purdue was all about the 2020 election being stolen. But then to make things even more complicated, Mike Pence jumped in and endorsed Kemp. The issue was not whether Kemp would get the most votes, it's whether he would get a majority because if Georgia law requires a runoff if nobody does. They actually even had a primary debate, which is really rare with an incumbent running for re-election. And I didn't watch that either, but apparently Kemp wiped the floor with Purdue. Originally, based on the polls, it looked like a runoff was probable. But in May, Kemp's polling surged and he ended up winning with 73.4% of the vote, outperforming every single poll. By like a lot too, like nobody saw that coming. He won by over a 50 point margin. But I will say, David Purdue's performance was not the worst performance for a former US Senator running for governor. We'll talk about that later. So the election is Brian Kemp versus Stacey Abrams part two. Politico rates this race as a toss up, but general consensus among political analysts is that Kemp is favored to win. Once again, clairvoyant, because Politico did change this to lean Republican yesterday. Next, let's talk about Iowa. Incumbent Republican Governor Kim Reynolds took over after the resignation of Terry Branstad in 2017 and is now running for a second full term. This is a very boring election. She got the Republican nomination unopposed and former Secretary of State nominee Deidre DeGere got the Democratic nomination unopposed. So by default, the election is Kim Reynolds versus Deidre DeGere. Wikipedia will list this as a three-way race with the Libertarian candidate, but that's only because of one poll that came out showing him having 5% support. This is the same thing that happened four years ago where this one poll showed the Libertarian nominee getting 7% of the vote and then they only got like 1.2%. At the time I made the TikTok about this race, Politico rated it likely Republican, but they changed it to solid Republican. And by the way, just like the next one I'm going to talk about, the primary was on Tuesday, June 7th. Okay, let's go to South Dakota. Incumbent Republican Governor Kristi Noem is running for a second term. As I mentioned in my Senate elections video, Trump had beef with John Thune because he didn't try to overturn the 2020 election. So Trump kept encouraging Kristi Noem to drop out and try and primary him for the state. Senate seat, but that didn't happen and she stayed in this race. Now, for whatever reason, Thune didn't face any notable primary challengers, but Nome did. She had to fend off former state House Speaker Stephen Hoggard, who said Nome was too weak on banning COVID restrictions, but Nome still easily won the nomination with 76.4% of the vote. In the Democratic primary, State House Minority Leader Jamie Smith ran unopposed. So the race is Christy Nome versus Jamie Smith. One poll came out that showed Nome with 45% support and Smith with 42% support, but that is not even close to true. I would put put all of my life savings on that. Like everybody else, Politico rates this race solid Republican and that probably won't change much. Okay, <clears throat> I've been editing all day. I don't know how many revisions I'm gonna have to do, but apparently Politico also just changed South Dakota to likely Republican. I don't know why, there was no explanation provided. Uh, might be a glitch or something, but I'm gonna go finish editing this because it's the last thing I have to do and then I'm probably gonna fall asleep for 12 hours. But if Noam does win, this will be the 12th election in a row where South Dakota elected a Republican governor, which is the longest streak for any state. The next June 7th primary is New Mexico. Incumbent Democratic Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is running for a second term. She got the Democratic nomination unopposed, making her surprisingly the first governor to run unopposed in a primary this year. Yeah, I need to make a clarification here. I, mean, I posted this TikTok before Iowa when I was doing it back in June. She is the first Democratic governor to run unopposed, but yeah, obviously the Iowa primary happened on the same day and both Reynolds and DeGere ran unopposed, so. The main candidates for the Republican nomination were State Representative Rebecca Dow, former National Guard Officer Greg Zanetti, Sandoval County Commissioner Jay Block, and former meteorologist Mark Ronchetti, which I pronounced Ronchetti in the TikTok, but I'm correcting my mistakes here. Ronchetti won with 58.4% of the vote and carried 28 of New Mexico's 33 counties. And insert breaking bad joke, haha, ha, because it's New Mexico and New Mexico is literally just known for breaking bad and that's about it. So the election is Michelle Lujan Grisham versus Mark Ronchetti. Politico rates this race lean democratic. Although Republicans are really hopeful about this race, even though Grisham won by 15 points in 2018. Unlike most states where Republicans nominated pretty conservative candidates for the governorship, they didn't do that here. Ronchetti is at least acting moderate, making the election about crime, and he's also pro-choice. Now let's talk about California, where the only interesting part is the primary. Incumbent Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom is running for a second term. Now, California does their primaries a little differently. Instead of each party having their own primary to select a nominee, every candidate, regardless of party, runs in the same primary and the top two finishers advance to the general election. There were 26 total candidates, including 13 Republicans, seven independents, four Democrats, and two from the Green Party. Everyone knew that Newsom would easily win, so the real question was who would come in a distant second place and then face him in November. By primary day, it was clear that that candidate would be either State Senator Brian Dolly or author Michael Schellenberger. Now, a 
lot of people argued for good reason that the Republican Party is basically a lost cause in California. So if there was any hope of beating Newsom, it was going to be Schellenberger because he's an independent. But regardless, it actually wasn't even close either because Dolly still won with 17.5% of the vote. And he also carried 12 of California's 58 counties, mostly concentrated around the area where his state Senate district is. So the race is Gavin Newsom versus Brian Dolly. I didn't know that much about Dolly until recently. Apparently he's like pretty moderate, but it doesn't matter. Politico rates this race solid Democratic. If Dolly wanted any chance at winning, his best strategy would probably be to leave the Republican Party, become an independent, adopt all of Gavin Newsom's policy stances, but just be like more likable. Now let's move on to the June 14th primaries, starting with Maine. Incumbent Democratic Governor Janet Mills is running for a second term. She ran unopposed for the Democratic nomination, while former Governor Paul LePage ran unopposed for the Republican nomination. Especially for a state with so many independent voters like Maine, this election was unusually boring. It's the first election in 60 years where both major party nominees had no challengers in the primary. And it's also the first election in 40 years with no major third party candidates. Because every single election since 1982 has had at least one, maybe even two third party candidates that got at least 5% of the vote. I mean, there is physician Sam Hunkler running as an independent, and I honestly think he probably will get 5% because there was one poll before he entered the race that showed 6% of voters wanted to vote for an independent candidate, even though there were none running at the time. Although nobody's been including him in their polls for some reason. So the election is Janet Mills versus Paul LePage versus Sam Hunkler. Politico rates this race lean Democratic. It will probably get changed to likely. Mills has been leading by a lot in all of the polls, and there hasn't been a single incumbent governor to lose re-election in Maine since 1966. And now let's talk about Nevada. Incumbent Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak is running for a second term. He beat one minor challenger in the primary, winning 89.3% of the vote. The Republicans had 15 contenders, but the main ones were former U.S. Senator Dean Heller, North Las Vegas Mayor John Lee, Clark County Sheriff Joe Lombardo, and former boxer Joey Gilbert. I went to Nevada just over a year ago, and at that time, Heller was in the lead. But in the end, he came in third, and Lombardo won with 38.3% of the vote. Gilbert won 11 of the state's 17 county equivalents, while Lombardo won five, but he won Clark County, where he's the sheriff, so, you know, that, that's where most of Nevada lives. And this is the worst performance for a former U.S. Senator running for governor this year, like I alluded to when I talked about Georgia. But it wasn't a total L for Dean Heller, because he won the state's least populous county by two votes. So the election is Steve Sisolak versus Joe Lombardo. Politico rates this race as a toss-up. I'm kind of rooting for Lombardo, not because of any policies, but because the election is on his 60th birthday, and that would, you know, losing would not be very fun. That's like a total vibe kill on your birthday. And he'd also be the first American governor born in Japan. Although he's not Japanese, obviously. <laughs> now let's talk about South Carolina. This one could end up being a little bit of a wild card. Incumbent Republican Governor Henry McMaster took over when Nikki Haley resigned in 2017 and is now running for a second full term. He also only had one minor primary challenger and won with 83.3% of the vote. The Democrats had five candidates, but the main two were former U.S. Representative Joe Cunningham and State Senator Mia McLeod. McLeod was considered a progressive and attacked Cunningham for not being one. Cunningham won with 56.5% of the vote and carried 32 of the state's 46 counties. So the election is Henry McMaster versus Joe Cunningham. In 2018, Cunningham was the first Democrat elected to South Carolina's first congressional district in 40 years. Although he lost re-election in 2020, but he still hopes to pull off a similar upset this year. That doesn't look likely because Politico rates this race solid Republican. The few polls conducted so far show the race closer than anybody really thought, but they could be flukes. And I try not to show my bias too much, but Joe Cunningham is like the best candidate of any election I've seen this year. He's got really good social media outreach. In fact, one of his ads that I had seen, somebody like reposted it on their TikTok and it got almost 2 million likes with the caption being, this guy should run for president, right? McMaster fired back by releasing probably the worst ad I've ever seen, not because the content or the quality was bad, but because the message it doesn't make sense. It basically was like, Joe wants to legalize weed and he drinks beer. And at the end of the ad, they call him a frat boy. No thanks, Joe, but we'll call if we have a frat party which is ironic because apparently McMaster was the one who was in a frat in college and Cunningham was not. If you've seen any of Cunningham's ads, you might know this, but this election holds the distinction of being the gubernatorial election with the largest age gap between the candidates. They're one day short of being 35 years apart. Okay, let's talk about Alabama. The primary was back on May 24th, but the runoff was on June 21st. Incumbent Republican Governor Kay Ivey took over in 2017 after Robert Bentley resigned and is running for a second full term seeking to become 
Okay, I have to take a breath for a second. Seeking to become the longest consecutively serving governor in Alabama's history. She had eight primary challengers, including a few notable ones like former U.S. Ambassador to Slovenia Linda Blanchard and businessman Tim James. But she pulled through and got 54.5% of the vote, narrowly avoiding a runoff. The Democrats had six candidates, but the main two were activist Yolanda Flowers and State Senator Malika Sanders Fortier. Two interesting things happened. Uh, first of all, obviously nobody got 50%, so there had to be a runoff, but also the last place finisher won a county, which you don't see often. Four weeks later, Flowers won with 55.1% of the vote and carried what, where is that on the script? But she became the first ever black major party nominee for governor of Alabama. So the election is Kay Ivey versus Yolanda Flowers. And this is the first gubernatorial election in a Southern state where both major party nominees are women. Politico rates this race solid Republican and last bit of trivia, if slash when Ivey wins, it'll make this most likely the last gubernatorial election in American history where the winner was a member of the silent generation. I said I was only gonna do 18 elections, but I'm gonna throw in the DC mayoral election because the primary was June 21st also and I'm in DC and the politics are pretty interesting. You wouldn't think so because it's basically a one party state with a bunch of minor parties and independents who never actually win. So the winner of the Democratic primary is basically the winner of the election. And really the only way that mayors lose is if they lose in the primary. That's what happened in 2010 and then again in 2014. Incumbent Democratic Mayor Muriel Bowser is running for a third term. She was challenged by city council members Trayon White and Robert White who aren't related by the way. But Bowser won with 49.1% of the vote and carried seven of the city's eight wards. This was the closest Democratic primary since D.C.'s first mayoral election in 1974. The D.C. statehood Green Party got second in the last election, and this time they nominated Corin Brown. There's also independent candidate Rodney Red Grant, whose team put up posters on basically every single street corner in D.C. I would not be surprised if he comes in second in this race, because you see his picture and name everywhere. But the biggest shock of all is that there's actually a real candidate for the Republican nomination. And I say that because on multiple occasions, the winner of the Democratic primary has also won the Republican primary because no actual Republicans ran, so people just wrote in the incumbent mayor. But this time, small business owner Stacia Hall ran unopposed. This is the first time Republicans nominated a candidate for mayor in 16 years. And it would be extremely shocking if she gets more than like 7% of the vote. So the election is Muriel Bowser versus Corin Brown versus Rodney Red Grant versus Stacia Hall. Politico doesn't rate this race, but if there was a category above solid Democratic and then above whatever category that is, this election would probably be in it. Another priority of Bowser's third term might be a DC statehood. You know, they're handing these out in DC all the time, these things right here, and they, uh, they have Bowser's picture on them. Now let's move on to the June 28th primary starting with Oklahoma. Incumbent Republican Governor Kevin Stitt is running for a second term. He had three primary challengers but still won the nomination with 69.1% of the vote. The two candidates who ran for the Democratic nomination were Oklahoma Superintendent of Public Instruction Joy Hoffmeister and former State Senator Connie Johnson. Johnson is a progressive which was in stark contrast to Hoffmeister who only joined the Republican Republican Party almost exactly a year ago, which technically made Hoffmeister the first Democrat to hold statewide office in Oklahoma in over a decade, but you know, like she wasn't actually elected as a Democrat. Johnson was like calling her out and was like, she's just gonna switch back to the Republican Party if she gets elected, so it's it's like a complete sham. But Hoffmeister still won with 60.7% of the vote and carried 72 of the state's 77 counties. There's also two third party candidates who like trade off polling 5% of the vote. One of them will probably actually get 5% of the vote, don't know which, but the election is Kevin Stitt versus Joy Hoffmeister and Politico rates this race solid Republican. This one I was not clairvoyant on, but yesterday Politico changed this race to likely Republican. And it was based on like, what, like two polls that showed it close? Oh yeah, so uh, the two most recent polls, one has Stitt at 44 and Hoffmeister at 43, and then the most recent one has Stitt at 47 and Hoffmeister at 44. But then all of the other polls show that it's not close, but if I were the Democrats, I would divert all of their funding in other races and focus it all here in Oklahoma because it's clearly winnable. <laughs> and finally, our last election of today, let's talk about Illinois. Incumbent Democratic Governor J.B. Pritzker is running for a second term. He faced one minor challenger in the Democratic primary and won with 91.8% of the vote. The Republican primary had six candidates, but the main three were venture capitalist Jesse Sullivan, State Senator Darren Bailey, and Au uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin. Bailey is a very conservative downstate farmer, and he was endorsed by Trump, but interestingly, Pritzker was also running ads for him. You see, Democrats have been meddling in a lot of Republican primaries this year to make sure that more conservative election denier candidates win the primary, because they'll presumably be easier to beat in the general election. Had Irvin won the nomination, this election could have been somewhat competitive, but the Democrats' strategy paid off because Bailey easily won with 57.7% of the vote and carried 100 counties. So the election is J.B. 
Pritzker versus Darren Bailey. The two have had beef since 2020 when Bailey sued Pritzker to stop his stay at home order. Also, side note about that. Um, the judge ruled in his favor, but only in his favor. You see, Bailey wanted to strike down the entire stay at home order, but all the judge said was that the stay at home order didn't apply to him specifically. And then a few weeks later, in typical 2020 COVID fashion, Pritzker said Bailey had a callous disregard for life because he didn't wear a mask during the legislative session. So yeah, um, wait. There's no way Politico still raced this race likely Democratic. That is shocking. It's not even going to be close. Pritzker defeated an incumbent Republican governor four years ago by 16 points, so I can't even imagine how not close this race is going to be because Bailey is very conservative. And he's from downstate, and, you know, often the winners of Illinois elections are from Chicago, but not only is he not from Chicago, but he also suggested kicking Chicago out of the state because it's too liberal. So that's really going to go over well with voters in Chicago, where like half of the state lives. Although no matter how likely it looks that Pritzker will win, he'll still probably spend copious amounts of his own money on his campaign. Because, you know, he can. He is the richest politician in the United States after all. So yeah, that only took three hours of filming.